Welcome to the Beach House 34 podcast, the place where we dive deep into stories about true crime and the paranormal. Today, we'll discuss a tragic case that seems to have no real motive and remains unsolved to this day. We're going to talk about the story of Elizabeth Barraza, who lived her life with passion, joy, and empathy, and is a case that is still in pursuit of justice. Now, this podcast contains information deemed truthful by the parents of Elizabeth, also known as Liz Barraza. The timeline has also been verified by the detectives working on the case. Please visit the website, whokilledlizbarraza.com, which was set up by Liz's parents to provide the most factual information about the case. Elizabeth was known as Liz to her friends and family, and she was born in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. Her parents were Robert and Rosemary Newell, and she had an older brother, Robert. As she grew up, the family moved from Illinois to Missouri, then down to Florida, and then to Texas, which is where the family finally settled. Now, Liz, she was a huge Chicago Cubs fan and absolutely loved Star Wars and Harry Potter. She graduated from Sam Houston State University in Texas, and she graduated with a degree in psychology. It was in 2009, while Liz was in college at Sam Houston State, that she met her soulmate, Sergio Barraza. Not only did they both enjoy movies, but like Liz, Sergio also loved Star Wars and Harry Potter, so it seemed just like the perfect match. Liz's dad said that Sergio made her very happy, and more than one person had even said that alone, they were two wonderful people, but when they were together, they were so much more amazing. They complemented each other. In 2014, after five years of dating, Liz and Sergio got married. Now their first home was a third floor apartment. They both had stable jobs, Liz as a data reporter for the Rosen Group, and Sergio worked for his dad as a flooring installation crew chief. Everything was great until their apartment was broken into. It was one of those situations that really shook you because their apartment was on the third floor where you wouldn't expect a break-in. Someone had to be really determined. And although there's no proof of this, it would almost seem as if they were targeted. It's not typical that a third floor apartment would be broken into. I mean, just think about the logistics of having to climb three floors, break in, and then carry whatever it was you had stolen down three flights of stairs. It just seems a little off, doesn't it? In the end, though, as with all break-ins, it's not the things that were taken, but instead it's your peace of mind that is snatched away. Now, this break-in was very traumatic for Liz, mainly because Liz had been raised to be extremely careful and aware of her surroundings. According to Liz's mom, during the day, her mom would see something on television about child safety. And when Liz and her brother got home, she would make them sit down and watch it. This got to be a near normal thing. And both Liz and her brother would constantly get annoyed with their mom for having to do this. Now, Liz's mom even said that they'd be driving somewhere and Liz would pipe up and say, Mom, someone's been behind you for a while. As Liz grew into an adult, she was still very security conscious. And according to her parents, Liz wouldn't even open her garage door before she backed her car out. She would get in the car, start it up, and then open the garage. Now, unfortunately, even with Liz's mom's good intentions, I mean, obviously, she likely brought up a child who was nearly OCD about safety, which likely made the break-in at the apartment even more frightening 
for Liz because Liz knew how to keep herself safe. She had learned this from a young age, yet it still happened to her. She had to feel powerless at that point. It wasn't long after this break-in at the apartment that the two of them decided to just go ahead and purchase a home in a suburb of Houston. And this suburb was Tomball, Texas. The home was in a middle-class development, and even though the neighborhood was safe, they still added a security system there, complete with a Nest doorbell camera because they had been burglarized at their apartment and they didn't want to take any chances. Better to be safe than sorry, right? After moving into their home, Sergio decided that he wanted to join the 501st Legion. Now, the South Texas Squadron of the 501st Legion is also known as Vader's Fist. But what exactly is this group? Well, it's not your typical fan club. This is actually a global organization that brings together Star Wars fans who express their love for the Star Wars franchise by creating highly accurate costumes. Think, you know, stormtroopers, Sith Lords, clone troopers, and more. These folks nail the look. But they're not just about appearances. The 501st Legion is committed to community service. They frequently dress up in their Star Wars costumes and head out to raise funds for charitable causes like the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And they also bring smiles to hospital patients, especially kids who have had to deal with childhood cancer. Now, getting into the 501st isn't a cakewalk, though. You've got to create a movie-accurate costume that passes Lucasfilm screen guidelines. Now, after approval, you're officially in. So Sergio built his standard Stormtrooper attire, which took him months to create. After you create your costume, you then need to take detailed photographs and submit them for evaluation. And if your costume meets the Lucasfilm standards, you earn your place in the 501st. Now, Sergio made the cut. Liz helped in the group by taking on the role of a handler. Now, you see, many of these costumes have very limited visibility. You can't see much below uh, your line of sight, I guess is the best way to put it, because the, the face coverings where the eye holes are just makes it really difficult to see below you. So what happens is that when they're at places where children especially run up to you, it's not always easy to see them. So the handlers make sure that everyone is safe while making these public appearances. Now, Liz later set her sights on becoming a biker scout and began constructing her own costume. Now, Liz's costume also made the cut, and she too became an official member about nine months after Sergio. Now, what's remarkable about the 501st Legion is their commitment to doing good. Uh, they don't charge for appearances, but instead they ask that those who hire them make a donation to one of their supported charities. Their catchphrase, even though they're referred to as Vader's Fist, their catchphrase is actually bad guys doing good. So when Liz and Sergio, they're part of this group and it's five, comes about five years later, it's their five-year anniversary that's coming up. They decide that they want to take a trip. And taking trips that surrounded their love of Star Wars and Harry Potter was very typical for the couple. Now, this year, for their five-year anniversary, they were going to celebrate by visiting the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios in Orlando. And the trip was planned for the end of January 2019. Liz never stopped talking about this trip. She was so excited. Sergio, for Christmas, had even gotten her a Harry Potter suitcase, and Liz had it packed weeks before their trip was to happen. Now, Liz was a planner, and she had this whole anniversary trip planned down to the detail. They even had special tickets for a behind-the-scenes look while they were inside the park. This was one of several trips that they had planned and budgeted for that year. 
According to Liz's mom, Liz had just as much fun planning the trip as she did going on the trip. Now, even though Liz budgeted for everything, including souvenirs and special snacks, she still decided to hold a garage sale shortly before their trip to earn a little more spending cash. Now, this struck me as a little strange, me personally, because according to Liz's mom, both Liz and Sergio had good paying jobs. They were financially responsible. They didn't have any debt. Um, every time they planned a trip, they put money into a separate account to pay for it. And this anniversary trip where Liz decided to have this garage sale, at least according to her mom, wasn't because Liz needed the money. They had already saved what they needed. They had their airfare paid for, their hotel, the park, everything. Her mom said that learning about Liz having this garage sale just days before they were to leave for Orlando made her mom crazy because she knew that they didn't need the money. Now, this might be true. This might not. I'm not saying that Liz's mom is lying. But what I am saying is that sometimes kids don't tell parents everything, especially when they're grown. And it's not because they're trying to keep something from them, but because they, they just really don't want them to worry. So think about this for a minute. Liz and Sergio's trip was planned on for January 29th of 2019. And this was a Tuesday where they were going to leave. Liz had her garage sale on Friday and Saturday, the 25th and 26th of January, just three days before they were set to take off. And garage sales are hard work. You have to plan, you have to set up, you sit and you wait for hours and hours while people visit in the hopes of earning a few extra bucks. And garage sales are not typically, they're not this get rich quick type of thing. According to Liz's mom, even the items that Liz had out for sale would maybe have amounted to about an extra $200 in spending cash. So why go to all that trouble? if everything was already planned and ready to go. As a matter of fact, Liz evidently had been planning this garage sale for about a month, but didn't tell her parents until about a week ahead of time. Liz had asked them if they had anything to sell, and they didn't. Now, this leads me to believe, though, and this is just my personal speculation, that maybe things were a little tighter than Liz's mom believed. If they had all this money saved and things like the airfare and the hotel paid for already, why did Liz feel the need to have a garage sale just to earn a couple hundred bucks? I think that there was potentially a money issue. And again, just my speculation. Another thing, though, is that Liz didn't even advertise this garage sale. So I wonder if she really had been planning it for a month like her parents said that she had. For someone who was such a planner, you would think that she would have had the date set. She would have marketed it so that she could get as many visitors as possible. But she didn't. Only a handful of people knew about the sale ahead of time. And the garage sale signs didn't even go up until the night before. Nonetheless, on that Friday, the first day of the garage sale, Liz took the day off of work. And Sergio, he was still going to work that day. But before he left, he helped Liz put some of the larger items out into the driveway. It's also reported that Sergio also told Liz that because she was going to be alone, she should turn on the alarms in the house. And this way, if anyone snuck into the house or she needed to run inside quickly, the alarms would go off. Was this a normal thing for Sergio to do? We already know that Liz was incredibly cautious. It's likely she would have done this on her own anyhow. And if it was true, why? Why would Sergio remind her of it? If this wasn't typical, why did he feel the need to tell her to do this on this particular day? Now, after finding out how much Liz paid attention to her security and her surroundings, I don't know how much stock I put in the statement that it was Sergio's request to arm the house. He may have said something, but it's likely that Liz would have done it anyway. Even on the day of the garage sale, 
Liz had the garage door open and the door inside the garage that led into the house was unlocked so that in the event she had to hurry and run inside, the alarm Liz knew would trigger instantly. So according to Sergio, Liz got up well, got up that Friday morning, got up well before he did. And she headed to Starbucks for some coffee. When she got back, he was up and moving and he then helped Liz get some things ready for the sale. Sergio then left at 6.48 a.m. to meet with his dad at Lowe's to pick up some supplies for the jobs that they were going to be doing that day as Liz continued to set up for the sale. She had a cash box with $100 in it and multiple items in the driveway, including a Stormtrooper helmet. And that's when things took a dark turn. Nothing in this whole scenario seems out of place. Nothing. Within minutes, though, Liz would be life-flighted to a nearby Houston hospital. At 6.52 a.m., a black four-door Nissan truck drove past the garage sale. It then made a three-point turn and parked at the end of Liz's driveway, its engine still running. Then, someone, and we say someone, because no one is sure if it was a man or a woman, got out of the vehicle and appeared to move pretty quickly toward Liz. In the very grainy and black and white security footage that police have released, you can see a person who is wearing what appears to be tall white boots and a long white coat or robe. It seems that the person has long hair, but since it's hard to tell if it's a man or a woman, it may have been a wig. Now on security cameras, you can hear the music being turned down at Liz's garage sale and Liz and her sweet, happy voice say, good morning. She probably thought that this was her first potential customer of the day. She couldn't be more wrong. The anonymous person then lifts their right arm, which is holding a gun. At that point, you can visibly see Liz back up very quickly and scream. The person says something to her and then extends their left arm, either showing or handing something to Liz before four shots ring out. Now, the first three came in quick succession while Liz was still standing. One of the shots went through her neck and embedded itself in the house. Two shots hit Liz directly in the chest, and the last shot occurred after Liz had fallen to the ground. The person then stood over Liz and fired the fourth shot into her face. Immediately, the person ran from the driveway to their truck and took off down the street. At 6.53, one minute later, a neighbor across the street called 911 to report gunshots. As this neighbor was on the phone, they looked out their window and saw the black truck drive off. Two minutes later, at 6.55, other neighbors who had heard the shots called 911. Security footage from a neighbor's house showed not only the truck speeding away from the Barraza home, but then the truck comes back from the other direction and again speeds by the Barraza driveway at 6.59 a.m. Now, some have speculated that whoever it was just wanted to be sure that Liz was dead, which is why they drove by again. Others think that the driver of the truck was just unfamiliar with the neighborhood and had to end up turning around to get out. You see, Liz's road ends up in a cul-de-sac. And while there are roads that lead out of the area, even after driving past Liz's house, the driver of the truck must not have known that they were there, which is why they ended up driving again past Liz's home in a desperate attempt to get out of the area. This is when the Nest camera 
outside of Liz's home does catch a good glimpse of the vehicle. Police arrived at the scene within minutes and quickly realized that Liz was in desperate need of help. Life flight is called, and when the helicopter takes off, Liz is still alive. Based on the information the police received from the neighbors, a BOLO, or be on the lookout, is issued for a black Nissan truck at 7 a.m. At 7.05 a.m., a deputy spotted a black Nissan truck heading south on Koikendal Road. Now, this road is only three-tenths of a mile away from Liz's home. However, it should be noted that we don't know exactly where on Koikendal Road that the vehicle was stopped because Koikendal Road itself, if you follow it south, it runs 14 miles long. So the truck was stopped, and according to the police, the driver had a valid reason to be in the area for work and was let go. The strange thing about this, though, is that Nissan trucks were pretty rare. Typically in Texas, the most popular truck brands are Ford, Chevy, Toyota, and Dodge Ram, now especially in 2019. So to see a Nissan truck that matched the description would certainly set off alarm bells, but in the end, the police didn't seem it was necessary to hold the person up. At 7.19 a.m., police enter the Barraza home to look for any other victims. Of course, Liz had armed the alarm, so as soon as they entered, the alarm went off and Sergio got the alarm notification and spoke to the police through the Nest camera on the front door. This is now around 20 minutes after Liz has been shot. According to Liz's mom, she too received a notification from Liz's alarm company on her phone because she was the second contact for the alarm company after Sergio. As soon as she received the notification, she called Liz. Liz's mom was one of the few people who knew that Liz was having a garage sale that day. She wasn't concerned, thinking that maybe her daughter had forgotten to turn off the alarm or something. Liz didn't answer her phone, and her mom got a gut feeling that something was wrong because it was so unlike Liz not to pick up when she called. Now, by this time, both of Liz's parents are awake and the alarm company then calls her and asks her, hey, should we call the police? Her mom said that, yes, they should, because Liz hadn't answered her phone. So Liz's mom and dad left as fast as they could and they headed towards Liz's house. As they were on their way, Sergio called them and said he couldn't get a hold of Liz either. As Liz's parents got to her neighborhood, they felt a little sense of relief because even though they saw an ambulance and police cars, it wasn't near Liz's house. It didn't take long for them to learn after speaking with the police and telling them who they were, that the reason that the vehicles were so far back was because the hospital helicopter needed a place to land and the helicopter had just left before they had arrived. Liz's parents, after telling the police who they were, were then separated and questioned to see if they knew anything. They still weren't entirely sure of their daughter's condition, but they knew it couldn't be good if she had been life-flighted to a hospital. Now, in the meantime, Sergio also arrived at the house, and the police then took him and spoke with him alone. Now, Liz's parents, they knew that Sergio at this point was being questioned as well, and they didn't want to leave him alone, but they also didn't want to wait too long before heading to the hospital where their daughter was. So during one interview, their Liz's parents had said that they waited for what felt like forever. They tried several times to reach out to Sergio's dad, Uh, They had to be sure that someone was there with Sergio. Either Sergio's dad or his mom had to come over and be with him, and they didn't want to wait much longer to head to the hospital. 
Now they ended up waiting for about another 15 minutes and then decided that they just had to get on the road. The hospital that Liz was at was in Houston and it was going to be at least an hour's drive. While they're in the car, they're calling family members to let them know what's going on. Now, even though 911 was called immediately after the gunshots rang out and Liz was life flighted to a hospital, the doctors weren't able to fix her substantial injuries. Even though she was still breathing with help, she was pronounced brain dead the following afternoon. Liz was only 29 years old. Liz, however, was as giving in death as she was in life. She was an organ donor, and because of her, five other lives were saved. Police continued to work the crime scene, and they canvassed the neighborhood. It was early when the crime occurred, so they hoped that some of the folks in the neighborhood were up and getting ready for work and they may have seen something. Later, it was determined that a neighbor across the street had a camera on the outside of their home. And as mentioned before, while it did catch the entire crime, the video footage was grainy and it was in black and white. So it made it really difficult to make out any details. The only camera Liz and Sergio had on their home was their front door nest camera. And even though the driveway is in front of the house, the camera on the front door is obscured by a long brick wall. So this means that only tiny snippets of audio were captured and no video footage other than a brief glimpse of the suspect's coat or robe not enough to add more information to the appearance of the suspect. Now, people were in shock when word started to spread about what had happened to Liz. Every time you hear, and this is just kind of a side note, every time you hear about a victim in a true crime case, they always seem to say they never had any enemies and, and such and, and so forth. And the one thing I kid you not, and I don't mean to make light of this, but the one thing that comes to my mind is something that is a quote from Joe Kenda, the homicide hunter himself, where he says, after hearing they had no enemies, he says, I disagree. They had at least one. Now, Liz's life, however, it didn't seem as though it would invite any negativity. They lived their lives by working and spending time doing things with the 501st. All Liz had been doing was setting up for a garage sale when she was ambushed and executed. The killer didn't take anything from the garage sale, so robbery was ruled out. Um, she also still had the $100 in the cash box near her when she was approached, and that was still there. To everyone who has now seen the video, it just simply appears as nothing but an execution. But why? You know, did someone live there prior to Liz and Sergio that might have had a sketchy past? Did they maybe mistake Liz for someone else? You know, some people believe that the killer was hired to kill Liz. Now, Liz's mom, Rosemary, told a local news station she didn't think that the person who shot Liz was the one who wanted her dead. She believed it was planned and that for some reason, Liz was the, was the target, but why Liz? No one could think for the life of them why anyone would want Liz dead. Now, some have also speculated that it seemed odd that Sergio was already gone before the killer pulled up to the house. Was there someone who wanted to be sure that he was out of harm's way before the hit? As stated, her mom and dad believed it was a hired hit. Her dad, though, said in an interview that the shot to Liz's head hit her just below her nose in her upper jaw. Now, if it was a professional hit, wouldn't it have been to the head? Uh, maybe they meant to hit her head, but they weren't very adept with the gun. 
could this have been something totally random? You know, it's possible. I mean, it's rare, but it's possible. I mean, just take a look at killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer who would target strangers. Now, while it's not common, it definitely happens. But Bundy and Dahmer had an overall purpose, for lack of a better phrase. The crime against Liz just seemed so one-off. There weren't any other crimes in the area where people were being randomly targeted. This whole thing just seemed to be on purpose. Additional surveillance was found by the police that shows this same truck in the area, in the area of Liz's home, around two o'clock in the morning. Now this leads you to believe that this was in fact a setup hours before Liz was set to open her garage sale. The truck drove past the Barraza home and then is seen turning onto Princeton Place Drive from Coikendall Road and then turning into the Goddard School parking lot. So to put this in perspective for you, the parking lot of the Goddard School is just two tenths of a mile away from the Barraza home. The truck is seen pulling into this parking lot at 6.47 a.m., exactly one minute before Sergio leaves for work. There were cameras outside the school, but unfortunately, they weren't working at the time. The only footage that the police have is from a business that was across the street from the school. The police looked for any shell casings from the gun, but none were found. In the video footage, you do not see the attacker pick up anything. So this led the police to believe that Liz was shot with a revolver. Now remember, one shot missed Liz and ended up embedded in the house. They discovered that it was a 38 caliber bullet. Now this bullet that ended up in the house is the one that actually went through Liz's neck. It's likely that during Liz's autopsy, they were able to recover the bullets. And so if they did, which they most likely did, if they ever do run across the gun, they might be able to match it. Now, what the police do know is that the truck was last seen heading down Sandusky Drive, which is actually within Liz's neighborhood. It's actually quite long, but this road too, ends up in a cul-de-sac. But the truck is not seen heading back down the road. So since the truck never came back, one theory that seems to hold a lot of water is that when they got to the cul-de-sac and realized there was no way out, they just somehow made their way through the area, likely off-road, and then hit a main road somewhere. Police did say later that the suspect's truck was seen on some commercial cameras, which suggested that they did somehow get to a main road. Now, none of the footage, you would hope, beyond hope, but none of the footage seemed to catch the license plate of the truck. So, this leads us all to wonder, right? Who then knew about the garage sale? Someone had to know that Liz would be there alone, right? Well, as mentioned before, Liz didn't post about it on social media and had only put the signs out for the sale the night before. And this was in 2019. And as of right now, which is 2023, there still have not been any arrests in this case. However, both Liz's parents and Sergio have done interviews since that time. And they've actually been pretty recent. They've actually been this year in 2023. Here is what they had to say. In an interview that Sergio did, he says that as far as he knew, the only people who knew about the garage sale were some of Liz's co-workers, himself, her parents, and he thinks his mother. They placed signs the night before. Um, it was already dark outside. It was January, so the sun would set very early. And it was about six or seven o'clock. So they put them out about six or seven, but it was still dark outside. In a later interview, uh, Liz's dad also speaks and says that the security footage that he has seen 
shows that the truck, before it gets to Liz's house, actually cut across the grass onto the sidewalk on the west side of her house before stopping and the killer getting out. And he also mentions that this truck was found on security cameras around 2 o'clock in the morning. So Liz's parents theorize that the killer, the reason, you know, obviously, you know, you see the same truck at like 2 o'clock in the morning and then this happens with Liz, you know, obviously it all just really feels like a setup. But Liz's parents theorize that the reason the killer was driving around so much earlier in the morning at two o'clock in the morning was that they might have been trying to figure out what vehicle Sergio was driving because sometimes he drove a truck but sometimes he would bring a work van home now after the truck does a three-point turn when they first go by Liz's house Liz's dad believes that it parked purposefully out of the range of the camera which leads him to believe that they knew that the camera was there. The theory that the truck hit a cul-de-sac and then went off-road instead of doubling back sounds totally logical to Liz's dad. They ran into essentially a dead-end road and then exited through an area of undeveloped land, which is called a green belt. Now, this would have taken the truck far down after they get off of this cul-de-sac, they would have been far down on Koykendall Road and well away from the police who were entering at Princeton Place Drive, which would have been a half mile north of where the truck would have exited. Again, we know that the police stopped a black Nissan truck on Koykendall Road, uh, but we don't exactly know where. I would sure love to know that. If anything, just to satisfy my own curiosity. So if you happen to know, please let me know in the comments. If the truck did drive through this undeveloped area, it's likely they drove through some weeds and some other things that likely adhered to the vehicle. Did anyone notice this on the vehicle itself when it got back to wherever it came from? Now, some have speculated that maybe it was a rental but surely, you know, this kind of damage or these leaves or whatever you want to call it would have been noticed as well, um, you know, unless they did a super thorough cleaning job. Of course, you know, best case scenario, maybe if it's a rental, um, there would be a way to track who rented the vehicle. And so far, no suspects have been named in the case. Now, in the same interview that um, Sergio did this year, he also said that when he was first notified by the alarm company and he was in his car, it was when he called Liz's parents. Now, he said that while he was in the car on the way home, he had been looking at his Nest camera footage on his phone and told Liz's parents that he could see police tape, but he was unsure if it was his yard or if it was next door. And this is corroborated by Liz's parents. Sergio also said that he called his dad after scrolling through the nest video and hearing the gunshots and hearing his wife scream. And according to Sergio, his dad told him to calm down. He was going to take the rest of the guys, so the employees who were also there at Lowe's getting supplies, and get them set up and then he'd be at the house. Uh, Sergio then said that once he identified himself to the police, they took him to a police car and asked him if he knew anyone who would want to hurt his wife or if she had any enemies. He said no, and he was confused. He still didn't know what had happened. Different police and different detectives kept questioning him, and they would ask if they had an argument recently. He said they didn't. They asked for his cell phone, which he then just handed over. And they still, they just wouldn't let him leave. Now, Sergio mentions, and we've mentioned before, that Liz got up before him and went to Starbucks and then came back. Sergio doesn't understand that if this person was sitting there literally in wait 
uh, waiting for Liz, why didn't they just attack her then? During this same interview, he mentions how he kept thinking that he was going to be late for work, but he had to help his wife set up this garage sale. A neighbor, though, mentioned that he, Sergio, left earlier in the day than usual, so I'm unsure what Sergio means about being late. The neighbor said that Sergio usually leaves around 7 o'clock in the morning. On this day, he left earlier. You know, maybe it was unusual that he would meet his dad and other workers at Lowe's early in the morning for supplies. So this might have been what he was referring to when he said he was afraid he'd be late. Uh, Liz's parents said that Sergio arrived at the house about 10 minutes after they did. And this is after they received the alarm notifications on their phones. So let's pick this apart a little bit. Once Liz's parents got to her house, they waited for Sergio to arrive. He arrives about 10 minutes after they did. So here's a little rabbit hole coming up because I just had to figure this out for myself. Now, earlier, it was said that Sergio was going to meet his dad at Lowe's to pick up supplies for their jobs that day. Now, if he had gone to the closest Lowe's, this would have been about nine miles away from his home. At that time in the morning, traffic wasn't bad. According to Google Maps, at seven o'clock in the morning on a Friday morning, it wouldn't take or it would take anywhere from around 16 to 28 minutes, depending upon which route he took to get there. Now, this is in 2023, but it's highly unlikely that the amount of time to drive to Lowe's or from Lowe's to his house would have changed very much since 2019. I could entirely be wrong about this, but that's just uh, my thought process right now. So, and I'm just thinking out loud here. Both Liz's parents and Sergio got the alarm notic notifications around 719 or 720, right after an officer had walked into the house, setting off the alarm. Sergio had left at 648 a.m. So he would have gotten to Lowe's somewhere between 704 and 716. So he would have been already inside of Lowe's when he got the notification from the alarm company. So Sergio gets the notification at, let's say, 720, not quite exactly at 719 when the police enter the home. He likely tells his dad, whom we assume he's with, about what happened and heads out to his vehicle. So let's say that this takes maybe two minutes. And again, it's early in the morning, so probably not too extensively busy. I could totally be wrong about that, though. So this would put Sergio leaving Lowe's at about 722 or 723. And taking the same route, if he took the same way home as he did to Lowe's, it would take Sergio about 16 to 28 minutes to reach home. So he would get to the house somewhere between 738 and 750. Now Liz's parents, after getting their notification, were up and moving within moments to Liz's house. Based on some very, very basic research, the only address I was able to find that would fit where Liz's parents' address would be is about six miles away. So on that morning, it would have taken them around 10 to 20 minutes to reach Liz's house. If they had left at 721, just a couple of minutes after the phone call, this would have gotten them to Liz's house between 731 and 741. They said that Sergio arrived about 10 minutes after they did. So let's say that somewhere between 741 and 751. And after I went through all of that, I thought, well, geez, maybe something isn't adding up here. It does. It completely coincides with what Liz's parents said about what time that Sergio arrived. So nothing seems off about this. Liz's parents are now at the house and Sergio shows up. The police immediately begin to question him. They know and 
as we all do, right, that the husband is usually the first suspect and know that he'd be rung through the ringer. So Liz's parents didn't want to leave him alone. Now, in the meantime, they're trying to get a hold of Sergio's parents because they don't want Sergio by himself. However, they leave for the hospital before Sergio's mom and dad even arrive. If they ever did, I'm still not exactly sure about that. So again, this is now four years later and Liz's parents are doing this television interview and they add some information which was not previously known. Um, her dad says that from the Nest camera in front of Liz and Sergio's house, you can hear Sergio saying to Liz, goodbye, honey, I love you, before he gets into his work van. Now, according to her parents, this is what the police told them. Now, we all know, and I mentioned it before, you know, suspicion immediately goes to the husband. He had an alibi, right? He was at Lowe's with his father picking up supplies. But this didn't mean that he couldn't have hired someone, right? A possible strange thing, too, was that remember what the neighbors said, that Sergio typically left around 7 o'clock in the morning for work. But on this day, he left over 10 minutes earlier. And this was even after he had helped Liz put some items in the driveway. So did the killer know that Sergio was going to leave early that day? It may not be anything substantial, but on the other hand, it seems off doesn't it? Sergio happily talked and answered questions put to him by the police. He didn't have a record, a police record. The relationship seemed very solid. There wasn't any evidence of infidelity and financially they were good. He took a polygraph and he passed. People have talked about him having hired someone to get rid of Liz. He was the sole beneficiary of her life insurance, but Sergio was so concerned about cashing in on it, he didn't. He didn't want people to think that he had something to do with his wife's murder. So let's talk about this audio, uh, at least the audio just from the Nest camera outside of the Barraza home. It's incredibly hard to hear. And people online have tried to break it down and some have tried to clean it up, but it's still pretty hard to understand. You can go on to YouTube and there are dozens, um, at least that I've run into, of videos where people are trying to decipher what is being said outside the Barraza home the night or the morning, excuse me, that Liz was killed. So if you're interested, I highly suggest you um, take a listen and see what other people have thought that they heard in these conversations. Now, in the case right now, there is very, very little to go on, but we do know some things. The killer just didn't run up and shoot Liz. They first spoke to her. And this seems important to the killer before committing the crime. It also appeared in the video as though the killer handed something to Liz. Now, this too has not been released by the police. It may be the single piece of evidence that they could use to tie the killer to the crime. It's something that police, you know, they always hold something back that only the killer would know. It could also have DNA on it if the killer went without gloves. But what would be the point of it? I mean, Liz is going to be shot. Why bother with some kind of note unless it was something that was important enough to show Liz prior to her being shot? The way that Liz greeted the person when they first approached her also didn't seem as though Liz knew the person. But then again, if the killer was wearing a disguise, even if Liz did know the person, would they have even recognized them? Some have theorized that the individual's walk, and again, this is something that you can find on YouTube and watch. You can see this black and white footage. Some have theorized that the walk of the killer is like that of a woman 
but when they turn to run away, it appears as though it may be a man. Others have noticed that the person looks like they have breasts, which means it could be a woman. But again, is it just part of an elaborate disguise? So in 2022, Sergio got remarried and is now married to his wife, Amber. Now, of course, this started lots of rumors that maybe Amber was somehow involved since he did remarry very soon after losing Liz. Sergio, though, says that he and Amber didn't meet until a year and a half after Liz was killed. And Amber, too, cooperated with the police. And it is said that she, too, passed a polygraph. It's also been mentioned that during Sergio's interview with the police, he gave the name of a woman he thought could have an issue with Liz. And this woman was another member of the 501st Legion. And he couldn't think of anyone else who had an issue with Liz. Even with this information, the police haven't yet arrested anyone. So it must not have been an issue. And then something else that people are speculating about was that it might be Sergio's dad who wanted Liz out of the picture because Sergio's paychecks had been bouncing. And this is online speculation. And that his dad, the reason these checks were bouncing was because his dad was spending money, the business money, on other women. And Liz evidently confronted him about it. Now, other explanations, which make totally more sense, <laughs> were that clients were slow to pay Sergio's dad, and this is why he was slow to pay his employees. Now, that may have been the case, but then why write a check in the first place if he knew it wouldn't be covered? And remember, there's no actual facts behind these, but it's just another thing that is simply interesting. Sergio says he has nothing to do with his wife's death, but he still knows that he's the prime suspect. Her parents, as like most of us, cannot figure out why someone would target Liz. Was it someone jealous of their relationship or their lifestyle? Her parents simply don't know. What they do know is that they have been told by homicide detectives that it is a solvable case. And this leads her parents to believe that maybe the police have someone in their sights, but they aren't quite ready to release any information until the person has been arrested. In the meantime, I've got my eyes and ears open for any further development in the case, so stay tuned. So, I want to ask you, listeners, to please remember Liz Barraza. Not just for how she died, but for how she lived. For her heart, her generosity, and the memorable mark that she left on this world. In January of 2022, Liz's parents created a website for Liz that focused on the actual truth instead of allowing people to just simply speculate. And the timeline on the site was reviewed and blessed by the detectives that were working on the case or that are working on the case. And if you're interested, please visit and I'll have all the links to everything I've talked about in the show notes. But this particular site is Who Killed Liz Barraza? And it is spelled B-A-R-R-A-Z-A dot com. The parents plead for information. And Crime Stoppers has a $50,000 reward available for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible. As always, Crime Stoppers is 100% anonymous, and you can reach them with any tips that you have at 713-222-TIPS, or in other words, 8477. So it's 713-222-8477. If you have any information, no detail is too small, please reach out. Let's try and bring some justice for Liz. 
Thank you all again for listening to the Beach House 34 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast. Until our next story, stay vigilant and above all, stay kind to one another. We will talk soon.